11 o'clock, actually from 10 o'clock to the time we shut off the lights, there should be one underlying theme of us attending this church, of us attending church, of us waking up in the morning to go to church, us going home and going to sleep after leaving church. From 12 o'clock Sunday morning to 11.59, 59 Saturday evening. We're going biblically from the time the sun sets on Saturday evening to the time the sun sets on Friday evening. Everything has a recurring theme is that we serve an awesome God. And if you don't know that you serve an awesome God, give the Lord a round of applause for his awesomeness in keeping us each day. Him allowing us to have a job, him allowing us to have a roof over our heads, him allowing us to have food in our stomachs, to allow us to have been a right mind, even when we've gone plum crazy, we serve an awesome God. Can someone say amen? So it's believed to keep on playing. Uh, what you just did corresponds with the message for today. And so I want to say thank God for inspiring you for singing that song. So I'm going to ask that we stand in reverence to the Word of God as we open up our Bibles. It'll also be on the screen. We'll open up our Bibles to the book of Hosea. What did I say? Hosea, the third chapter. And we'll read verses 1 through 7. I want to hear your voices as we read Hosea chapter 3. Sorry, 1 through 5. I apologize. It's 5 verses, not 7. 1 through 5. It's the whole chapter of Hosea. Let's, of chapter 3. Let's read together. So then Hosea said to me, let's read. Go again. And it's committed adultery, <clears throat> just for the children of Israel, to other gods, and love the raising cakes of the pagans. So I bought her and myself for 15 shekels of silver, one and a half homers of barley. And I said to her, stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have us man, so too will I be toward you says also, the next verse, it says, For the children of Israel shall abide many days without king or priest, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without ephod or teraphim. Afterward, the children of Israel shall remain, return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. <clears throat> I'm going to go and read to you right here. It says, verses 1 and 2. Then the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery. Just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel who look to other gods, love the raisin cakes of the pagans. So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver, one and a half homers of barley. Family, I would like to share with you at this moment, the sermon title today is there's only one. There's only one. If you don't mind, if you can bow your heads with me in prayer, Father God. You are truly awesome. As we come into this place, Lord, we are not deserving to be here. The Bible does tell us the wages of sin is death, and there is none righteous, no, not one. We all are deserving of death. But your awesomeness allows us to have breath because the gift you have given us is eternal life through you, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we thank you as we come here. There is nothing of ourselves, any pretense or fashion of ourselves that we should be here. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords. So, Lord, as we come at this place at this moment in your presence and with each other in cor corporate as well as on Zoom, congregation worship, we ask, oh God, that you will speak to us again in our ears. So Lord, I pray, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts to be holy and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength, and O Lord, our Redeemer. Let us all say it together, amen. 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 You all may be seated in the presence of the Lord. 
As we've been going over the 28 fundamental beliefs of the church, we have been going over many themes, and we have continued over again. There have been times that we're not going in linear order off the 28 fundamental beliefs, but we're going to be covering them throughout the year. And as the last time I was here, we were speaking about the great controversy, which was last week. But this week, we're going to cover two, as well as leading us into communion and the goodness of God. And today, we're going to speak about marriage and the family and also the church. The church and marriage and the family. And I'm going to want to like for us to look on the screen as I'm going to read to you uh, this portion right here. And it's going to be another one. It says, marriage was divinely established in Eden and affirmed by Jesus to be a lifelong union between a man and a woman in loving companionship. For the Christian, a marriage commitment is to God as well to the spouse. It should be entered into only between a who? Man and a woman who share a common faith. Mutual love, honor, respect, and responsibility are the fabric of this relationship, which is to reflect the love, the what? The love, sanctity, closeness, and permanence of the relationship between Christ and his church. As we read once more, the church is God's family, adopted by him as what? Its members live on the basis of the new covenant. The church is the body of who? A what? Community of faith of which Christ himself is the head. Let's read this together. The church is the bride for whom Christ died, that he might sanctify and cleanse her. I was having a portion of learning and going over the sermon at the beginning of the week. I have to tell you as well, I, I, I have been very busy. My wife and I, we've been doing some things around the house and trying to make sure that we get the yard up because family, just to let you all know, I don't like weeds. Can someone understand? If you understand what I mean by not liking weeds, you can say amen. I am trying to do my very best because the more you could eradicate the weeds in your yard, the less amount of times you have to cut the grass. Can someone say amen? I don't want to be cutting weeds and not cutting grass. Weeds grow faster. And so working on those things and, and even the aspect of, of my wife and I are talking about trying to put together garden boxes so we can grow our own food. Growing your own food in a subdivision. Lord have mercy. But as I was going there, I, I, was, I was also recognizing and thinking about the NCAA tournament. I didn't even get a chance to watch much of it. But I went to bed. And as I went to bed, I, I woke up and, and I got some text messages that were sent forth by a text group that blew my mind. And for us, we probably know what I'm about to come towards in this. It's, it's about the Oscars. Uh-oh. The Oscars. The Oscars, the, the, the Academy of the Wars, it, were the greatest and the most astute and the best actors, actresses are trying to anticipate the time when they get their award. For example, there's a people coming to take pictures and, and, and look at the, the people go down the red carpet to, to poll for, for a moment so that the people, the media can have it in their newspapers or magazines or television screenshots or whatever. It's, it's a time where they see people coming down and, and groups who are getting awards and also a person who is anticipating and got an award himself. Uh, as you can see, the person on the lower right-hand corner, all those who are looking on Zoom and those who are looking in the church, it's, this person's name is Will Smith. Come on, say, if you know what I'm talking about, you can say amen if you know what I'm talking about. And Will Smith received the award and a reward for best leading actor. But just a few minutes earlier of him receiving that award, he got in a situation where Chris Rock came up and gave a joke about his wife, Jada Pinkett Smith, and said in the con into the audience that the audience, he said, this woman, she looks like she, she said, love your hairstyle and can't wait to see you for the next G.I. for G.I. Jane 2. And the whole audience laughed. And honestly, so did Will. He got up after a while and <clears throat> didn't even know about it. Someone and, and slapped Chris Rock. I'm not going to show the picture, but you know what happened. And in the discussion in the text message, it caused me to look at this. And as I was looking at it, it, it blew my mind. As Chris Rock was giving a joke about Jada Pinker Smith, as he's giving a joke about her, 
I, I, I found out more that she was struggling and she went through alopecia. That's why her hair was cut in. And I don't know, in fact, for those who understand, I just only really recognized up until this past week, this, this week, that there is more than one type of alopecia. I've always been aware of the one that's called traction alopecia. The one on the lower right hand says, a form of hair loss, which occurs when the hair is, re is re repeatedly, is when the hair is repeatedly pulled by wearing hairstyles that are just too tight, such as braids or ponytails. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? I've only recognized that kind of alopecia. But as she has been talking about, of how she would take showers and she would notice that blot splotches of hair would come out of her head and she cut it. And all of a sudden, Chris Rock may have known, may have not. He said he did it and made a joke about her hairstyle. Will Smith, who was once laughing, came up and slapped Chris Rock. It is now the talk of the media. It is now the attention that is brought forth into the time that we are in. But family, I want to share with you, though, is that even in this aspect, and we're going to give some illustrations, but I don't want us to be so caught up on Will Smith, Jada Pinkett Smith, and the altercation with Chris Rock that we don't, that we forget that we are living in some serious times right now. It is not about watching the Oscars because I didn't even know about the Oscars. That's how irrelevant the Oscars have been to me. I didn't even know about the Oscars, but this situation or brought me to attention to some things, but even still, God had to let me be reminded that these things are ultimately a distraction in the whole span of the world we live in. What am I talking about? Just a couple of days ago, maybe some time ago, not, not too far back, President Biden comes up and starts speaking about an economic new world order. We're not talking about those things. We're talking about a man coming up on a ward, hitting someone, and we don't recognize that the Bible is proving itself true. Revelation 18, verse 3 tells us, it says, For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxuries. We are seeing people right now who are struggling to pay for gas, who are struggling to pay with the fact of inflation going on with all these products, and these companies are posting record profits in this time of people's financial struggles. We are seeing that nations are now talking about now having a reset of finances, and we're just only focused on entertainment when the Bible is proving itself true over and over again. All nations were going to drink of the wrath of, the, of, of Rome's fornication. But we still can use these principles up here in a loose connection with what's going on in the story of Hosea. Hosea, his, his name means salvation. It, it could be connected with Joshua of the, of, the, of the family line. And the beginning of the book of Hosea, is, as you will look at it in chapter 1, God tells Hosea, he tells Hosea to go and marry somebody. It is very good to marry. Can somebody say amen? He says, marry somebody. And as Hosea is, is waiting for God's direction on who to marry, God tells Hosea to marry not the, the, the cleanest woman, not to marry the woman with the best reputation, not to marry the woman who, who, who will be the one who will give recognition like Proverbs 31, that Proverbs 31 woman. He tells, go, he tells Hosea, to marry a woman who is known to be a harlot or was going to eventually become a harlot, one who will not be faithful to him, one who will bring dis disgrace to the family's name, one who will be a laughingstock to the community. He, God, tells Hosea to marry this woman. This woman's name is Gomer. And as he is married to Gomer, he is, they have been receiving children. The, the first child that they had, he, he said, the Bible tells us, it says right here in, in chapter one, it says right here that, that he has his first son. He has his first son. And, and as he names it, it says Jezreel. He says that that's his name. The next child's name is Lo Ruhamah. It's a daughter. And he says in Lo Ruhamah that, that he will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel. As, as 
Hosea is looking at this second child. He's, he's starting to notice that this child doesn't have some of the things, but possibly could be his. And then they have a third child, and the child's name is Lo-Ami. And it simply said, you are not mine. Didn't need Maury Povich. And it got so bad that Hosea finds his wife somewhere, and Hosea, who has married this woman, who has given of his own resources to marry this woman, is now in a position of seeing her in a place that she should not be, and Hosea will have to give resources to get her. Family, I'm going to share with you right now, is as in this understanding, I, I want us to have this understanding in this, in this lens right now, is that we as a church are very similar to, to Gomer. We as a people are very similar to Gomer. And God is truly the true, real Hosea. Can someone say amen? It, it's we as a people. We, we have gone after other gods. We have gone after other people. We have gone after other things. And we have taken away our connection with God. And God told Hosea to marry someone who he knew was going to do wrong. Marry her, love her, have children. And he tells, as we just read in chapter 3, as he finds Ho Gomer, Hosea finds Gomer, in a place that she not, should not be. She should be at home, but she ain't home. She's had two different children from maybe two different daddies, but they ain't Hosea's. And God tells Hosea to go and love that woman again. What kind of God do we serve? As messed up as we are, God says, I'm going to love my people again. I'm going to share with you some potent points, and we're going to make this connection off of this as we get here. Potent point, potent point number one is that in this aspect, in the marriage concept of what we're going to speak about, is that make sure that the person that you marry is God's choice. Can someone say amen? For those who are single, in the sound of my voice, those who, those who are single, those who are looking at marriage, those who are in the process of getting married, Always make sure that the person you marry is God's choice. So the white gets counsel. If, if you pray two times a day, you need to pray four times a day before you get married. Because the person you marry is going to have eternal ramifications on your ultimate destination. You're not just marrying someone to marry someone. You are binding with them heart to heart and soul to soul. And if they say things that belittle you, it's going to eventually mess you up. I'll tell you right now, and I'm, I'm adding this to the sermon. I, before I, I married my wife, amen. Hallelujah. Listen, no marriage is perfect. Am I telling the truth, right? No, no marriage is perfect. But there are some marriages that you need to stay away from. And before I got married to my wife, I was engaged. I was engaged to this young lady. And guess how long the engagement lasted? I'm adding this into the sermon because I want you to understand to make sure that what the person you marry is God's choice. Guess how long that marriage lasted? I'm engagement, engagement. No, not a year. Come on, come on, Elder Clark, come on, come on. Six days, come on, you don't even give me the benefit of the doubt. At least I, let me get close to a week. Come on, Elder Clark, come on. Six days. And I add this to there is that when I shared it with the church, because we were going to look at using the church for mar to get married at, and, and I told the church that the engagement is off in, at the end of our board meeting, one lady literally said, praise God. That ain't it. And multiple members from that time on kept on telling me, pastor, it was not a good choice. Now, what if I would have, what they didn't tell me anything. It was, they didn't tell me anything until it was afterwards. I'm sharing this to us all that in your relationships, your courtships, make sure that the person you marry is God's choice. That's how it can be where it says in, in Hosea chapter 3, verse 1, it says right here, it says, Then the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel who look to other gods and love the raising cakes of the pagans. Love someone that isn't loving you back. But God told, sorry, God told Hosea 
to go and love Gomer again, make sure that the person you marry is God's choice. Because here's some scriptures. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12 says, Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. That's why it says it in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 10. You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. You can't put an ox and a donkey on the same plow and think you're going to get the same result, get good results. See, see the, the ox is focused on doing the job. The donkey will kick in his heels and say no. And if you try to put the two together, it's going to cause some chaos on the field. You want the two to walk together, to plow together. And if an ox is with a donkey, you're going to have some issues with your, with your, with your track. That's why it says in Amos 3, verse 3 is, can two walk together lest they be agreed? And that's why it says in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Because who you are walking with, who you are with, you have to be aware that that person is ultimately someone that you are accountable with for your ultimate destiny is to make it to heaven. Gomer is now a slave. And God tells Hosea to go love this woman who did not love you enough to keep true to the marriage vows. God tells Hosea to be connected to a woman again who didn't think enough of him to stay in the house, who was so comfortable enough that she found herself in a dangerous position well, now she is a slave, and God tells Hosea to go and love this woman again. See, the issue, family, back to the Oscars, is not just the fact of the situation of, I'm sorry, Chris Rock laughing or making a joke on Jada Pinkett Smith's hairstyle. The problem comes down to is this, is that when we look in the background, that there are some situations between Will Smith and his wife. There are some serious issues between the two of them. And as there's some serious issues between the two of them, they may have, and there has been some, uh, y'all know me, I've been here for almost five years. You know I tell you I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm not from the, I'm not from the, the clean streets of Cincinnati. I'm from the hood part of Cincinnati. God is good. Can someone say amen? And, and, and there's some discussions going on with, with Jada, who used to like another rapper, who used to be in a friendship. Don't know nobody that she ain't spoken to, but was in a friendship with another rapper who's been dead now. And one person made the comment. I said, really? It has been that long. This artist has been dead for almost 30 years. Y'all know I'm talking about his name is Tupac Shakur. For those in the hood, we don't call him Tupac Shakur, we call him Tupac. There are issues, and, and there has been some, some, some connotations that she is not comfortable as much with Will. She would like for him to come or have a similarity to, to Tupac. And if she, and one person, I, I listened to it, it said, don't ever marry or don't ever be with someone who has dead people as their, as their history because you will never meet up to it. There are, these two people are in drastically different viewpoints. This right here is the time when they had on, you see in the middle, a, a red table. And this red table talk was when the time when, when Jada Pinkett Smith found herself with a, a artist, a rapper, whose name is connected with a month of the year before September and after July. And she called it not an affair. She called it an, what's that called? What did she call it? What was it called? Y'all know, come on, we talk with each other, an entanglement. Make sure the person that you marry is God's choice for you. Because see, family, in this aspect, I'm looking again off the connection coming back here. See, we can look into a certain degree, and this is a loose connection. Jada Pika Smith is a type of the church. Church, plural, the, the universal church. Will Smith is 
and this is in the differing aspect. Will Smith is in the differing aspect, the response of God. We're coming somewhere with it. And we're going to speak a little bit about Chris Rock. See, understand this right here is that it comes down to that make sure that the person that you're with is the person you're supposed to be with. Point, point number two is this. It says, point, point number one is make sure that the person you're with is Mary. The person you marry is God's choice for you. Very important. Point number two is marry someone you are willing and you are prepared to protect. Verse two says right here. So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and a half homers of barley. The equation of that is coming to be a, the, the one and a half homers of barley. Barley is the, the cheapest of the grain. It's the most coarse of grain. It's, con, con, it's connotated with poor people. It, it's a, interesting that the person who had control of Gomer was willing to sell Gomer back to Hosea for 15 shekels of silver. Did not ask for 15 homers of wheat or any other grain. He was willing, this person was willing to sell Gomer back to Hosea for 15, 15 homers of barley. What poor people are used to. It was the price of a slave. He was willing to sell, not for 30 pieces of silver, but willing to sell for 15 pieces of, 15 shekels of silver and 15 homers of barley. This person did not have any regards of Gomer, but Hosea was worth, say, I'm willing to pay for it. You better marry someone who you are willing to pr pr protect. That's what it says in the Bible. That's what it says in the Bible. It says right here in Psalms chapter 17, verse 8. This is what is coming forth. It's, this is what we are asking of God to do. It says, keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings. God is willing to keep us under the shadow of his wings. Ephesians 5 verse 25 says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, uh, sorry, Colossians, um, Colossians chapter 1 verse 21 and 22 part 8 says, and you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. Jesus saw enough of the church, saw enough of people who are fallen, who have messed up, who have left God, who have gone after other idols, who have gone after other gods, who have gone and kept God away. But God loved us so much that he came down on this cross to die for us by shedding of his blood so that we can have a new outlook in life. When you marry someone, you are marrying someone that you are must be willing to protect. Too many times people are looking at getting married just for the, the time when the sun sets. Too many people are, are trying to get married to someone who they think that they can get up in financially. But when you are marrying someone and you are connecting with a person like that, you have to be willing to even risk your life. Now, ladies, I've used this in my marital counseling sessions and premarital counseling times. How many ladies want to be with a man if, and I hope that doesn't happen, how many women would like to be with a man if someone broke into the house that he's hiding underneath the bed and asking you to protect him? Ah, he, he look good. He look good. No, you don't want that. Come on, you'll say amen. See, this is the difference right now coming to the application again of Hosea. Hosea sees Gomer and is willing to spend to get her back. A dowry and then to reclaim. Christ created us. We messed up. Christ died to redeem us. He paid for us two times. Now, here's the thing going back to the connection with Will Smith. Now, I, I, I'm going to let you know, family, there is something noble in defending your wife. Amen. But the method that he did it was wrong. In front of the whole audience, 
in front of everybody. And I just said that Jada Pinka Smith is in a certain way. We're looking at a church, Will Smith, in a certain way, God. But the audience is like the universe. The whole universe is looking to see what is happening here on planet Earth in this great controversy. How, how, how God loves messed up people so much that he's willing to, yeah, he died for messed up people. And the audience, the Oscars, the, the audience is looking at seeing what God would do and he already has done. And this is a spectacle to the whole universe. Now, now, now here's the thing. When the joke was brought forth, see, God in the aspect of what the devil has done, and I did not add this in too, is that the devil in a loose connection is what Chris Rock said. Hear me out. I'm not calling Chris Rock the devil. But what Chris Rock said was a type of what the devil does. The Bible tells us that Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. And see, when, when Will Smith heard the joke, he laughed at first, but then he got up and he hit Chris Rock. Now, remember, in heaven, there was a situation where there was God, angels, and there's two covering cherubims. And as I was doing some reading, and, and it was a connection, and I'll speak, I'll work on that for another, but I'm just giving you a loose connection, is that we understand that Gabriel in Daniel tells us that he's one of the covering cherubs. The Bible also tells us that, that there's two covering cherubs, and the Bible tells us that Lucifer was one time a covering cherub. And so Lucifer started being in the presence around God. Now, who's the, who, who he lost his place? It is looked at that Gabriel took over Lucifer's spot, and the aspect of the first person who is one of the covering cherubs is Michael. Michael, the archangel. And so in that, my, our Michael, the archangel, is Jesus Christ before he became flesh. And so here it comes, family. It that Lucifer was in the presence of Jesus, Michael, and he starts saying that I will send myself be like the most high because he thought that he was in the same presence, same area as Michael, Jesus. He thought that he could be like God. And that's why the battle is between Lucifer and Jesus. And here's the thing I want you to understand is that Lucifer has used words and actions to try to belittle and demean God. That the Bible tells us that with his tongue, I mean, with his tail, we spoke about the last week, that he drew a third of the stars. With his lies, he took a third of the angels with him. And the question is that God is all-powerful, God is almighty, and God is all-knowing. Why didn't Jesus, why didn't God destroy Lucifer, smack him upside his face at that very moment when he could have? Why didn't Jesus feel the blow on Satan, when, on Lucifer, when he could have at that moment? See? Nothing wrong with defending your woman. There's nothing wrong with defending everything. But the question is when. I want us to read something. This is what Sister White says in Great Controversy, page 496, 497, 498. It says, God in his great mercy bore along with Lucifer. In his what? Great mercy bore along with Lucifer. He was not immediately degraded from his exalted, come on, I need y'all to read, from an exalted station when he, was, when he first indulged the spirit of discontent, nor even when he began to present his false claims before the loyal angels. Long was he retained in heaven again and again, come on, let me hear you, he was offered pardon on condition of repentance and submission. Such efforts as only infinite love and wisdom could devise were made to convince him of his error. God in his spirit permitted to carry forward his work until the spirit of disaffection ripened into active revolt. Let's read this. It was necessary for his plans to be fully developed that their true nature and tendency might be seen by all. Come on. Had he been immediately blotted from existence, they would have served God from fear. If Will Smith did not hit Chris Rock up there and spoke to him later, if Will Smith would have kept it on, say, hey, Jada, let's walk on out. If Will Smith would have kept the even kill, the audience responded that what Chris said was a bad joke, but now people are looking at it and saying, what Will Smith did was wrong. If Will Smith would have done what God did with Lucifer, there would have been a different view of Will Smith right now. 
God loves his people. God loves his creation. And God knows what's best. He did not strike Lucifer when he could have. He said, I'm going to sit here. And even though it takes a long time for it to come through, the whole audience, the whole universe sees now that following after Lucifer's adv advices is going to be dangerously wrong. And as a result, we trust what God has said from the beginning. Y'all hear me? I'm saying, y'all hear me? So point number one, we spoke about it. It's what? What is it? Come and read with me. It says what? Make sure that the person you marry is God's choice. Number two is what? Marry the person you're prepared to protect. Point number three is this. Marry someone, read with me, who will protect you. It's not just about you protecting your spouse. It's about your spouse protecting you. Let's see, you're going to see verse 3. It says right here. And I said to her, you shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. So too will I be toward you. There's a responsibility of the woman, the bride. The bride is symbolic of the church, of how she responds to her husband's love, how we as Gomer responds to Hosea's love. Gomer could have stayed a slave, whipped, abused, mistreated, but Hosea saw something in her. God said, buy her back. And Gomer, I mean, Gomer is bought back by Hosea. The church people, we are messed up. We should be on this. We are all willing and worthy. We should be dead. But God bought us back. Can someone say amen? Let's see what it says in these verses. Ephesians. Like I said again, Ephesians 5, verse 25, the husband loved your wife, but I'm going to go down to 5, verse 26 and 27. It says, husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. The objective of him doing that is verse 26 and 27. It says that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. What God has done for the church, we're supposed to respond to him by living holy and pure lives. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 4 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons of Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. That's good news, y'all. And finally, Galatians, Colossians 1, verse 21 22. Now, I just said that earlier. You see part A, but I'm going to read it again. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. There is a response that the church needs to have in protecting the name of God. How we act shows forth the name of God. Should we be comfortable, should we be comfortable with Gomer acting a hot mess to defame the name of Hosea, who loved her and, and married her? And if she got bought back, when she got bought back, that she goes back into a life of harlotry? No. Should we as a church, should we go back into sin? Should we go back into to, to making God's name an embarrassment to the whole wide world here, planet Earth? Or should we have lives that are holy names? And we have responsibility in our love back to God to protect his name. The sad thing about that red table talk was not just the fact that Jada said that it's entanglement and not an affair. The sad thing is not just that Jada Pinkett Smith, when, when, when Will Smith, on, and what happened on the Oscars on, I think, Sunday night, when Will Smith was about, when the joke came forth and she got mad and she rolled her eyes, and Will Smith's about to get up, if a woman cares about a man, she would have said, don't you dare go up there. She should have protected Will. 
But now will is the major butt of the conversation. She should have protected will. But going back to the red table talk, the sad thing about that red table talk was what the very last things was at the end of that show said. And this is what they said, and you'll see it on the screen. They literally said, bad marriage for life. And pounded each other. God loves the church, that he makes the church messed up as it is and fixes the church, that a church that has a sordid reputation, a church that has a messed up background, a church that has issues, he's made each and every one of us to be clean, pure in his sight. And our responsibility is to go back and, re and respond to his love. See, family, for us today is there's nothing that we can do for God. Nothing. There's nothing that we can do for God. See, as we go over the Sabbath school lesson, the Bible, Sabbath school lesson tells us that, that God is self-existing. He, he is not created by anything. He is before there was, and he will be if there is no more to come. God is self-existing. No one else is self-existing. We exist partially because of our parents, but primarily by the will of God. Psalms 139, verse 3. Isaiah 49, verse 5. Jeremiah 1, verse 5. I'll say those again. We exist by the will of God, Psalms 139, verse 3, Isaiah 49, verse 5, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. And we go from zygote to fetus, from fetus to newborn, from newborn to infant, from infant to toddler, from toddler to child, child to adolescence, adolescence, young adult, middle-aged, senior, even when our parents are laid to rest, who are the ones that we came from, ultimately we truly come from God because God still allows breath to be in our lungs. Our existence is still dependent on the one who exists simply because he is. And we can do nothing for God. All of our talents that we have, but we must not use, but I'm sorry, all the talents that we have, but unfortunately, many of us don't use them to glorify God. We just use them to enhance our own selves. And God sees and knows. That's one way we can honor God is that when it comes down to, when it comes down when, when we walk in and out of the church, there should be a reverential buzz, a reverential presence felt, which causes our media, our conversations that we don't need to talk about in the church, it will cause our conversations to stop. When we are asked to use our talents, we, for example, when we're asked to read scripture or we're asked to teach Sabbath school or we're asked to sing or something, we should be using our talents because God bought us back. When it comes down to nominating committee, the nominated committee should be difficult for this one reason and this one reason alone is that, that the nominated committee has a responsibility of choosing which one is best at this moment to accomplish the departmental task because so many people are willing to serve rather in whatever capacity they can. Instead of getting a whole bunch of phone calls and saying, no, nah, I don't want it, I don't want it, I don't want it, it should be the nominated committee is struggling to put the person in because so many people will be willing to do it. How do we respond to God's love? Do we sit in church to be entertained or do we do service for him to glorify his name? The church. The church is God's family adopted by him as children. His members live on the basis of the new covenant. The church is the body of Christ, a community of faith for, of which Christ himself is the head. The church is the bride, the what? The bride for whom Christ died that he might sanctify and cleanse her. Next portion. At his return in triumph, he will present her to himself a what? Glorious church, the faithful of all the ages, the purchase of his blood, not having spot or wrinkle, but what? Holy and without blemish. And we do what? Join, let's read it, for worship, for structure in the word, for the celebration of the Lord's Supper, for service to humanity, and for the worldwide proclamation of the gospel. That's why we're here for communion service. We, like Gomer, I found other interests beside in the, besides in the God who look beyond our faults and sees our needs. We very well could be the next one up on to be sold. 
Our value greatly diminished, but God overbids for us. He doesn't buy us at market value. He goes way above the price. Our value is death. He paid for it with his death. Our price is separation. Jesus left the glory of heaven to the project of the universe. Our auction calls for slavery. Jesus places us heirs to the kingdom to come. And that's the only reason why we could eat this communion. He humbled himself to place us here. And if you eat this and you're still mad at someone and you're not trying to remedy the issue with the other person, you should feel guilty putting the bread and the juice in your stomach. Jesus didn't hold a grudge with you. He bought you back. You shouldn't hold a grudge with someone else. See, I'm not necessarily focused on the Will and Jada and Chris situation. It's an illustration on the love that God has for us. See, remember the sermon title is what? There's only, see, no human being can make a healthy marriage. No human being can take someone who doesn't really care about them and make them love them. God doesn't even make us love him. God just shows his loving kindness again and again, and eventually we as followers of him will follow his guidance and his love. Only one person can can see how messed up we are and show that love on a consistent basis, not retaliate, not kick back, not get mad, not get up on the stage. Only one person can ride it out and knowing the right time to bring his people to be with him. Only one person, and it's none of us men or women here on this this building or in this city or in this state or in this country or in this hemisphere or in this world. None of us can do it. Only God can do it. And that's the reason why when we partake of the communion, that's the reason why as messed up as we are, we are celebrating a God who broke his body, shed his blood for us to be included with him in heaven. I just want you to chew on that for a few moments of the love that God has for each and every one of us. Don't you dare forget that if any promise, as Elder Gil just said, if there's any problem that's come forth, that we can go to our daddy. Ain't nothing daddy won't do for us. Ain't nothing daddy was going to hold back from. He wants to see each and every one of us saved. So much so that when we get to heaven, I got an issue with my knee. Even now, the weather get cooler. I, 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 messed, up my, um, I messed up my joint playing basketball. And, and now that when the weather starts getting cooler, I'm trying to feel that thing on my knee, y'all. Come on, come on, y'all. My, my, my wife was looking at me, and she, and she, she said, Mark, was there something on your chin? You know what it was? It's a gray hair. Lord have mercy. She also, she also, she also, I've been married and now I'm starting to notice that I'm getting some thinning up here. Come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. But when I get to heaven, amen, when we get to heaven, I'm, I'm not going to have that issue with my knee any longer. Come on, say no more arthritis. I'm not saying it's arthritis, but it's starting to be some pain in the cold. I'm not going to have any more gray hairs on my chin. Come on, say amen. And I'm going to have a full head of hair. Amen. Because when we partake of the communion, we are celebrating the God who died and ra- 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 rose from the ground to bring us to be back with him. We are deserving of our situation. We can't buy it back. We can't earn anything. We just have to put trust in only the only one who can save us. So as we get ready for communion, we're going to have a song of worship. Then after that, we're going to get ready. We're going to have prayer and we're going to begin the communion. We're not doing foot washing. I want you to be aware there's only one who loves us with everlasting love. There's only one who will take upon all humanity, live a perfect life, and die so that we who have been imperfect can be holy again in Christ. A God who did not retaliate, but a God who has shown his consistency, his love. So now the whole universe knows that they are on the right side. And we do too, as we come and we participate in the community. Let us bow our heads for prayer. Father God, there's only one. You alone, Lord, are worthy to open the seals. You alone, Lord, are worthy to redeem us. Angels may have begged to 
be the ones who walked on this earth to and to live, a, live and, and die for us. But created can't save created. Only way we could be redeemed is by you, Jesus, and you alone. And so all the attacks that Satan has brought forth on you, the, the ridicules, the spits, the laughter, the mocking, the nails, the piercings. Lord, only you, when we get to heaven, Lord, in my pain, what I'm going through right now, what the pain we may be going through right now, only you in heaven will still have marks of what you went through on earth for eternity. Only you, God, can show us what love is about. So, Lord, I pray that you'll be with us. Lord, I do pray for the situation that went on this past week, and Lord, be with the Smith family. I pray that you'll be with, with Brock and be with all those participants in that. But Lord, I pray for us, Maranatha Fellowship. God, at this moment that we see of the illustration, the story of how you called Ho Gomer to be redeemed by Hosea. Gomer, her name means complete. Hosea names means salvation. Lord, she had a way to go, but Lord, you were working on completing her because you had, you had Hosea, salvation, to be impacted upon her. We are incomplete, but thank you, Jesus, for your salvation that you're working on us right now. And so, Lord, as we hear the song, and as we begin communion, Lord, we pray that you will be in everything that is said and everything that is done. Keep us as we are committing ourselves to be holy thine. We give you the praise, glory, and honor. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.